Trains, trains, and more trains. That's what you'll find in Chicago, Illinois. But why here of all places? Why not New York City, Detroit, or Los Angeles? Chicago, even before the railroads, was seen as a promising hub of trade and transportation. The land was flat and fertile for farming, had clean water sources, and the region had a reasonable climate, experiencing all four seasons. Being located along Lake Michigan, among other rivers, created shipping opportunities within the area too. The region had previously been used for fur trades between the Native Americans and traveling Europeans. Chicago was incorporated as a town in 1833 and later as a city in 1837. Thousands of people soon flocked to the burgeoning city, building homes and setting up shops. Shipping by water was a huge draw for entrepreneurs. Using the Great Lakes and the Erie Canal, they could eventually reach the East Coast and Atlantic Ocean. It became the fastest growing city in the country. Its population quickly surpassed 20,000 as the Illinois and Michigan Canal was completed in 1848, linking the Great Lakes with the Mississippi River. This would be rivaled by the completion of the city's first railroad and train station that same year though, the Galena and Chicago Union Railroad. It was built from their Chicago terminal near the convergence of the Chicago River in its north branch, heading northwest for Galena's lead mines. Elsewhere in the country around this time, new railroads were popping up all over the place, and just like the people, they were expanding westward. The Michigan Central reached Chicago in 1852, and the Michigan Southern and Northern Indiana arrived in 1859. They wanted to increase business by connecting major cities like Detroit and Pittsburgh respectively with the boomtown of Chicago. By 1860, 10 railroads ran into and out of the city, cementing its place as America's rail capital. All sorts of interchanging of freight and passengers would occur within the city. In 1862, George Pullman established the company town of Pullman on the south end. It was at his Pullman company that luxury sleeping rail cars would be built. Back in downtown, grain elevators, taller buildings, telegraph lines, and plenty of ships dotted the urban landscape. Nearly 300,000 people lived in the city by 1870. Railroads had spurred the development of Chicago suburbs as people built along their path. After all, it was the fastest way to get around on land. Trains would bring in timber from the north, grain throughout the Midwest, cotton from the south, and people and frozen meats from the east. The completion of America's first transcontinental railroad in 1869 linked Chicago with the west and its trade with Asia. Its location was conveniently positioned as a sort of middle ground for railroads coming to and from all directions. Trains from the west came to Chicago to interchange with everyone else, and vice versa. This benefited the area as after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, the mostly undamaged railroads were able to expedite shipments of aid to the people. Following the city's rebuilding efforts was a boom of railroad construction in the 1880s and 90s. The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, Wabash, Sioux Line, Milwaukee Road, Elgin, Juliet, and Eastern, Baltimore and Ohio, the Nickel Plate Road, among many other railroads found themselves setting up shop in the Windy City. The second industrial revolution had created ideas of mass production, standardization, and rapid industrialization. A faster paced world meant a lot of people needed to be moved and fast. The Chicago and Southside Rapid Transit Railroad was the city and country's first rapid transit line in 1892. American railroad mileage hit its peak in 1916, with 254,251 miles, a bit over 100,000 miles of which fed into Chicago. Around 1,294 trains daily came into and out of the city. Crack streamliners paraded into the scene throughout the 1920s and 30s. The 20th Century Limited, Broadway Limited, Hiawatha's, The Super Chief, among many others, raced for the fastest schedules possible. The city was known as Streamliner Central. Throughout the 1940s, six passenger terminals, all shared amongst the railroads with passenger service, hosted their trains. 2.5 million passengers arrived and left every week, with 1.8 million being commuters. Passengers could make several connections to get where they needed to go in the country. Fast electric interurban lines could take people deeper into the suburbs and to their homes. 
On average, a passenger train arrived or left Chicago every 51 seconds, but during the morning rush hour, it could be every 6 seconds. Around 30 railroads traveled on over 7,000 miles of track within a 200 square mile area. Sorting the massive amounts of freight took place in around 100 or so rail yards. Belt railroads like the Elgin, Jolia, and Eastern, Belt Railway of Chicago, and Indiana Harbor Belt were built mostly around Chicago to transfer freight from one larger railroad to another. These came about in the late 1800s, as within the urban and industrial centers, traffic bottlenecks would form due to so many trains crossing paths. Trains served numerous industries, whether it be the famous Union Stockyard, steel mills, perishables, or local businesses. In 1948, a fair was held to celebrate 100 years of railroads in Chicago. Post-war optimism for the railroads continued into the 1950s, but this would be the last promising decade. New highway networks and competition from the airlines began to affect all American railroads in the late 50s, and especially into the 60s. They were losing mass amounts of money operating passenger trains with aging equipment. As one service was canceled after another, the US government created Amtrak to take over most inner city and long distance passenger trains. They got to work revitalizing the former Pennsylvania Railroad Yard they inherited at Union Station. The same could not be said for other terminals. Grand Central Station was demolished in 1971, and Central Station met the same fate in 1974. Dearborn Station had its train shed removed in 1976, but was later redeveloped as office and retail space. LaSalle Street was torn down in 1981, and the Chicago and Northwestern Terminal in 1984. The latter two would be replaced with more modern structures. Moving to the present day, Chicago remains America's passenger and freight rail hub with over 1,300 trains passing through each day on 3,865 miles of track. Four major passenger stations see over 700 trains a day. Union Station, LaSalle Street, Millennium Station, and Ogilvie Transportation Center. Union Station is the main hub, being the fourth busiest in the U.S. It hosts 15 Amtrak routes and six Metra lines. The other three have Metra and South Shore line trains. Metra has 11 lines leading into the suburbs in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The South Shore runs east to South Bend, Indiana, and the Chicago Transit Authority offers elevated and subway train service in the Loop and suburbs. As for freight, six of the seven Class 1 railroads meet in Chicago. A handful of industrial, switching, short line, and regional railroads also operate in the region. Around 500 freight trains move through the city each day, with over 50 yards sorting cars and loading trailers and containers to keep America moving. Looking towards the future, the Chicago Region Environmental and Transportation Efficiency Program, or CREATE, looks to continue reducing rail and road traffic congestion. This involves elevating tracks, creating flyover bridges, and eliminating railroad crossings. Chicago became America's rail capital because of its enviable position in the country, its climate featuring all four seasons, flat and arable land, ease of land and water transportation, access to natural resources, and overall fast growth led to its current status. Suburbs and commuter rail also developed outside the city as railroads and people expanded westward. Chicago's rail capital status will likely stick around in the foreseeable future. Trains have become a crucial part of its international trade and public transportation. After all, I can't really think of anyone who wants to be stuck in traffic on I-90. So, next time you're visiting Chicago, Maybe it would be best to take the train.